Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panelists. William Drayton, CEO and Chair, Ashoka, Innovators for the Public. His Excellency, Mohammed Al Girgawi, Minister of State for Cabinet Affairs, United Arab Emirates, Chairman, Dubai Holding. Robert E. Rubin, Chairman of the Executive Committee, Citigroup Incorporated. <laughs> Mohammed Yunus, Founder and Managing Director, Grayman Bank. Oh. And our moderator, Daljeet Dalewal, Anchor, PBS. Each of our panelists have produced high impact results in their own unique way. So what we want to do this morning is to share some of those success stories uh, with our audience and talk about how they are approaching uh, some of the world's most intractable problems with innovative and exciting solutions. Last but not least, we have with us Bill Drayton, who popularized the term social entrepreneur. He's also President Clinton's uh, pick, apparently, to become a winner of a Nobel Prize, I think. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> uh, your organization um, wants to engage young people. It is engaging young people. And uh, Mr. Gagawi gave us some examples of how they're doing that in their part of the world. Talk a little bit about why you think it's important to engage young people and also... What are some examples of some of the projects that you're most proud of in terms of Ashoka's work? Share some of those success stories with us. Um, th this brings us back to how do we get to a world where everyone is a change maker? Um, there's a big bottleneck. Uh, only the children of the elite are given the opportunity when they're growing up to know that there are change makers, to actually master the very complicated social skills, not genetic skills, empathy, teamwork, leadership. The only way you master that is by practicing. And the only way that you know that you have those skills is by having done it. And the critical time is before 20. When we interview the entrepreneurs that we work with, you can almost always find that they started as a teenager. They, they had the experience that they had an idea, they built a team, they left something. Once that happens to someone, they are a change maker for life. So um, learning from the about 20% of the Ashoka Fellows who are focused on young people who do this over and over and over again, it is dramatic. Math and language scores shoot up. But much more important, young people know that they're powerful. Now, let me just ask you a really basic question. What is the key factor for success for any human grouping, a city, a company, a country? The half-life of the competitive advantages of technology or marketing is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. The one thing that really makes a difference is what proportion of the people in that community are change makers? Why did San Jose take off and St. Louis die? Um, why is Google able to challenge in market after market? Because they're trying to build very consciously a, a community of people where everyone is creative, everyone's a change maker. We know that that's what the future is about now. How do we actually make that happen? So we are working with the fellows across the world to build a civil rights, a women's movement for young people so that not just the children of the elite, so all young people have the experience of being powerful, which means causing change, which is what the whole Clinton effort is about. What is giving? Giving is ultimately causing change. Uh, that's what makes everyone in this room happy. We're, we're confident. We know we can learn anything. We can do anything. We have the gift of knowing we're change makers. It's almost hard to imagine what it's like not to have that gift. The cruelest thing you can do to anyone in a world where change is increasing, and this is literally true, in a logarithmic rate, 
is to not give people the gift of being a change maker when they're a young person. If you have a 14-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 17-year-old or you have a friend in that age range and they're not being powerful now, you should be alarmed. You should be asking, what's wrong with the educational system? Why are we denying that opportunity to all but a few people? It's just unbelievably destructive and cruel. I'll give you one example of the difference this makes. Um, one of the first youth ventures we had in this program is a young uh, African-American boy from Cambridge, Massachusetts, actually, who was brought to our attention by the police department. Um, he had a fascination with bicycles, other people's bicycles, which was <laughs> something of a problem for the police. But they were very smart, and they said, this guy really, he's got something. And so they suggested him <laughs> to us. And he, uh, he created something called Second Gear Bikes. Some of you may have seen it on Mass Avenue between Cambridge and MIT. It's a, uh, one storefront, then two. And his deal was any young person in the neighborhood could come, and if they worked uh, and learned for 35 hours how to build and rebuild bicycles, they get a free bike. Now, how do you get the free bikes? Well, look, Cambridge police, as you know, have lots of bikes because they recover them and they can't find the students. So they're dying with bicycles. Um, so he didn't have a supply problem. Well, of course, he, many uh, kids came through this program. It was very dramatic. You go there and, and, you know, we talked to him about his not, this is not just a bike shop. This is an early step in this revolution of everyone a change maker. He got that. He was very capable and very eager to tell other people that that's what he was doing. Now imagine, and, and he's now gone not to jail but to college and is, is uh, a success. Now imagine if we had 100,000 young Americans every year who had that experience. And, and our experience is that every Jason you have three to five in the core group and maybe 20 doing the tutoring or running three hours of the virtual radio program a week or whatever it is. So you have a multiplier. If we have 100,000 young Americans starting their own idea, building their own organization, leaving something lasting, tutoring service, whatever, um, that means two million young Americans every year are having that experience. That means we can tip the culture in school after school. If you have five of these groups that succeed, that means 100, 150 kids, five peer groups selling to their peers. They can do it better than any of us can. You start creating cultures of competence and can versus can't. I would argue that we've got to do this all over the world. Your points in the Middle East are exactly right. Any country that falls behind in the proportion of its population or change makers is going to be a loser. 10 years, 15 years from now, and the opposite is true. This is absolutely critical. But you say that everyone is a change maker, but when you're cultivating uh, role models and your fellows across the world, isn't it natural to want to sort of focus on the brightest and the biggest? So in, in that sense, isn't there a, a kind of a, a conflict of interest, sort of on the one hand saying that everyone can be a change maker, but the natural inclination is to want to kind of focus on a few of the best. So how do you marry those two conflicts? I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question because one of the things that just upsets me actually quite a bit is when people say, well, I don't believe that everyone can be a change maker. Now, uh, when you look at adults that did not have that experience that we did when we grew up, of course they're not change makers. How do you suddenly become a change maker at 25? You haven't mastered these underlying skills. It's not your definition of yourself. You're in a pattern of relationships that's very different. You're stuck. That's exactly the point. These lives have been very severely limited. But when kids hit 12, they are totally ready for this. What they want to do more than anything else is figure out how to be really effective in human society. And we say to non-elite kids, no, 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 we're in charge, adults are in charge of everything, the classroom, the workplace, if there's any extracurricular sports left, you know, we run those too, and you're not very responsible. Well, where have you heard this before? This is how we used to treat women, African Americans, colonial people. This is incredibly destructive. This is the last large group of people we treat this way. And, you know, it's exactly in those zero to three, you've got to get 
emotional health, this is the time you've got to learn these social skills and define it. Now, if anyone in this room was denied the power to be a change maker, just think, I mean, how naked would you feel? How out of control? Where, where would the satisfaction we all get from being able to contribute, which is the most powerful way of giving and helping others? And to say that we are going to deny that to others is just wrong, absolutely wrong. It, it makes no sense if you think about the future of any society. It doesn't, it's absolutely cruel. It's the most destructive thing you can do to a human being is to deny them what is most important for us. And I don't think you have to be brilliant. You just have to believe and give yourself, and you know, once you know you have that ability, you have it. Um, you know, Jason's life is different. So Jason Upshaw, the guy I was just describing in Cambridge, all the kids he's working with, we can do this. And to not do it is just outrageous. Okay, well, I think we have about five minutes left, so it's going to be a sort of a, a whiz around everybody just to sort of get your kind of closing thoughts on this session. Um, Bob, do you think that there are enough change makers, as Bill is talking about them, in, in business and in government? I think Bill's point is essentially right. Actually, Bill, if you, businesses that have tried to empower their workers have had remarkable results. And I, I think your point is very well taken. I, uh, I think that uh, I know of cases of businesses that have gone out broadly amongst their workforce, just regular middle of work, run of the mill workers, and have said, all right, what would you do in this situation? And have had tremendous results from it. So I think your point is basically right. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this morning and for sharing your wonderful stories uh, with us. And thank you also to all of you for being here with us this morning. Thank you.